You guys know about the Fiat 500 Abarth, the hot version of everyone's favorite little drivable puppy, the Fiat 500. It's faster, it looks cooler, it handles better, and it has a freaking scorpion on it. Well, what if I told you that that badge represents one of the earliest tuners in the world, a race proven company so influential that its name is Italian slang for strong. Are you ready to expand your mind and join the ranks of the illuminated? Throw up the triangle and get ready to feel the sting, baby, cause it's freaking scorpion season. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on a Bart. Huge thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. I I'm sorry you had to call again. Yes, sir, I'll handle it. Guys, that was Mr. Nord, and he's pretty upset that you're still not taking your online security seriously. We talked about this last week, all right? You gotta protect your internet privacy today by using NordVPN. NordVPN is accessible, it's easy to use, and keeps your browser secure and concealed behind a high-tech wall of smart encryption. NordVPN doesn't share, track, or do any data collecting whatsoever. So you can safely Google, was James Pumphrey in Two Broke Girls without anyone ever knowing? Choose from over 5,200 servers in 60 countries, and the best part is NordVPN is very fast, so you'll never have to miss your favorite show when traveling abroad. You can download it on Windows, Android, iOS, macOS, and even Linux. And right now, if you go to nordvpn.com slash donut nordvpn, you'll get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's all risk-free thanks to Mr. Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So please check it out. I don't want Mr. Nord to be upset with me again. All right, so there's this dude, Karl Bart, and he's born in Austria in 1908. He moved to Italy as a teenager, changed his name to Carlo, and got into motorcycles, all right? Big time. As in, he designed and built motorcycles, which is almost as cool as being a, a state runner-up in improv and speech and debate in Kentucky, which is what I was doing in, as a teenager. But he wasn't just a motorcycle mechanic. He was also a motorcycle racer. He won his first race when he was 20 years old on a bike that he designed and built himself. And he did that by himself, like with no fricking pit crew or support team or anything. So already this dude is next level. Well, I'm about to throw another level on top of that level. All right, the next, next level. Carlo won the European Motorcycle Championship the next five years in a row. After that, he was like, racing a uh, other motorcycle is boring. What else can I race? How about a train? And I'm not talking about just any train, all right? This dude raced the best train, the Orient Express. Carlo destroyed that luxurious choo-choo in an 850 mile race across Austria. A Bart was tearing it up on two wheels, showing trains who's boss. Flawless victory. You think you're the boss, you freaking train? Turns out you're not. I am. Everything was going great. Little did he know that his world was about to change forever. Forever. Carlo. Woke up in a hospital bed in 1939. Doctors told him that he'd been severely injured in a motorcycle accident and that he'd never ride again. And then, freaking world war broke out. What is this now? Can we get a break? I'm being robbed of my adulthood. I digress. Uh, everything that Carlo knew was crumbling around him. I can relate, obviously. Thankfully, he had plenty of time to rethink his plan. He had to stay in that hospital for a year to recover. He probably thought up all kinds of plan B options, but one made more sense than any of the others. Carl knew that he had a knack for engineering and a dirty little kink for speed. He just couldn't ride a motorcycle anymore. I imagine he damaged his taint. And as we established before, he'd already made trains his b so what's left? cars. 
When the war finally ended, Carlo got a job as a design engineer at a brand new car company called Porsche. Then he moved on to an Italian sports car manufacturer called Sicitalia, which promptly went bankrupt. It was post-war Europe, so it goes. Bummer. But at that point, Carlo was like, you know what? None of these guys ever even beat a train in a race, okay? I have. I bet I can run my own sports car company. And I bet I can buy one for pretty cheap. So he bought Cis Italian, and in 1949, he transformed it into a Bart and C. Not Co, all right, just C. It was race car buddy Guido Scagliarini, which sounds racist, but it's his name, who just happened to come from a very rich family. Make friends with rich people, guys. Then you make them like the same stuff that you like, and then you get to do that stuff. Carlo's idea for a Bart and C was to apply his motorcycle hot rodding skills to develop aftermarket go fast parts for cars. Actually, his real idea was to make his own sports cars, but they didn't have enough money yet. So a Bart didn't really plan to be a tuning pioneer. This was just a means to a bigger goal. But that doesn't make it any less cool. This was 1949, more than 20 years before AMG, before M or any of those guys came onto the scene. Why am I comparing a BART to these in-house manufacturing tuners? A little thing I like to call foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Things are gonna get crazy for a BART real quick. But first, if a BART and C was gonna make cars badass, they needed a badass logo. It's like the most important thing for a company. You think, you think we'd be here without this? So Carlo turned to the most badass thing that he could think of, astrology. <laughs> Uh, I guess he was at a loss for ideas because he was like, what's my sign? I'll make that into the logo. Done. Now, thankfully, he was a Scorpio, which is rep by a Scorpion, which is like the coolest one on the Zodiac calendar. If he were a Cancer, we would have had a crab. <coughs> <coughs> With a sick logo nailed down, a factory ready to go, and a rich co-owner ready to drop G's on development, all a Bart needed was something to sell. Now, Carlo knew from his racing days that modifying exhausts was an easy way to make motorcycles go faster and sound cooler. Why not apply this to street cars? So that's exactly what he did. He also copped a trick from the Cis Italia playbook to make them look cool. A matte black finish with flashy chrome tips. A Bart exhaust didn't just sound amazing. They were like jewelry for your car's butt. Ooh. The people of Italy absolutely ate this up like so much gabagool. And by the end of 1950, a Bart had sold nearly 5,000 custom exhausts. Now, let me say that year again, 1950. A Bart and C was founded in 1949. All of this happened in one year. What could Carlo and his team establish in another year? All those muffler profits got Carlo the cash that he needed to develop more complicated and expensive tuner parts. But more importantly, to him at the time, it meant he finally had the scratch to build a sports car of his own. Buying Cis Italia gave him a head start because the deal included a half-built race car called the 204A. Bart finished the car, then he raced it all over Europe with his business partner Guido behind the wheel. Guido wasn't just the scratch behind a Bart, he tore crap up in the 204A. And Bart used the prize money from winning all those races to build the company's first street car. The 205A. All right, before I say anything uh, else about this car, I want you to look at it, okay? It's beautiful. It's because of Bart hired a dude from legendary Italian design house Bertoni to draw it up. This thing was quick, too. Carlo and C doubled the horsepower on the 1.1 liter Fiat engine. The 205A was sleek, speedy, sexy, and very, very expensive to produce. A Bart only sold three 205As. This obviously wasn't gonna work. So building your own car is expensive, we got that. And developing performance parts took time, good to know. With that valuable information at hand, Carlo refocused. Maybe there was a way to work with an established car company to make these badass road cars that I wanna make. Maybe, but he need to find one. One with lots of money. Wasn't already building sick little street racers. Company like Fiat. 
Only problem, Fiat was based in Turin and Abarth was more than 200 miles away in Bologna. Solution, move Abarth to Turin. This was a big, expensive business move, but it proved to be genius. Fiat was aware that thousands of their customers were fitting Abarth exhaust to their cars. And hey, wouldn't you know it? Now Abarth is just down the street. Carlos just like, oh, hey man, I'm new in town. Uh, just wanted to introduce myself and, oh, wait a minute, you build cars? Fiat saw, we're the largest automobile manufacturer in Italy. There's no way you are unfamiliar with us. Our cars are legion. What? What a coincidence, because I can make cars faster. What? I can make cars faster. What? Sorry, my bad. I made the exhaust on those cars. I said I can make cars faster. Fiat and Abarth struck up a working relationship in 1952. Abarth would undertake special projects for Fiat, and in return, Fiat would foot the bill and retain rights to the cars. In the industry, that's what we call a win-win. After a few roller coaster years of big swings and even bigger whiffs, Carlo finally felt safe. And as you psych majors know, you gotta feel safe before you can work to your full potential. And oh man, Carlo felt very safe. Just look at the first joint Fiat Abarth project. This is the Fiat Abarth 1500 by Posto. Now look at this thing compared to the car that it was based on, the Fiat 1400. That's what most cars looked like back then. Now credit for this spaceship goes to Bertoni. Bertoni made this car beautiful, but Abarth, he made it fast. He took the stock 1.5 liter Fiat engine, worked his scorpion magic, and wrung an astonishing 68% more power out of it without using a turbo or a supercharger. It was a cosmic leap in power to match the car's cosmic looks. Carlo and C were getting really, 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 really freaking good at this. The 1500 by Posto was displayed at the 1952 Turin Auto Show and people went absolutely ape. This car put Fiat Abarth on the map. They became the talk of the freaking town. They were like the first power couple. The Italian super duo built a few more over the top prototypes like this one in the early years, but that's not really what Abarth is known for. So we're gonna fast forward a few years to the introduction of the Fiat 600. Not the 500, that's gonna come later. The 600 is the 500's older brother. It was a little rear engine city car, kinda like a cross between a Volkswagen Beetle and a Mini Cooper, but without any of the reliability or performance that made those cars good. Just the cheeky design language. But once the Scorpion stung the 600, it was nothing to fool around with. The Bart modified the 600 with bigger carbs, juiced up internals, and of course, brappy exhaust systems to create a whole line of tuned 600s. Most of them used the stock body, modded with fender flares for wider wheels and a beefy front air dam. But every now and then, they do one up real special. For example, take a look at the Fiat Abarth 750 Zagato. If you've been watching this show since the beginning, you know Zagato. It's another legendary Italian design house, just like Bertoni. They designed the prettiest Aston Martin ever made, the DB4 GTZ. The Fiat Abarth 750 Zagato isn't as pretty as those cars, but you gotta remember what they started with. And as you can see, Carlo was living his best life. He was doing what he loved with the financial backing of Fiat, and Fiat loved it too. People were buying Abarth 600s, racing them, Crashing them, coming back and buying more of them. Cha-ching much? Now just when Carlo thought things couldn't get any better, his bosses at Fiat asked him to drum up some publicity by going out and beating some world records. And he did it in this, the Fiat Abarth 750 record. Freaking so confident that he named the car record. Basically, it was a lightweight, streamlined version of the Fiat Abarth 600. Lightweight, as in like 850 pounds. So it only needed 47 horsepower to shatter a 24 hour endurance record on its first try. And this was just the first of 133 records that Abarth would set. Now, breaking records is cool, but again, it's not really what Abarth is known for. So let's get back to that then. Let's talk about the original Fiat 500. All right, just like the modern 500, the original was cute and slow, like 13 horsepower slow. Carlo had his work cut out for him, but remember, he just smashed three world records with only 47 horsepower to play with. 
He was confident that he could work his magic with the 500, and that's good because Fiat was in big trouble. Now, the OG 500 is an icon now, but when it launched in 1957, nobody was buying them because the car journalists of the time said it was unreliable and slow, and they weren't wrong. Fiat had screwed the pooch on this drop, so they turned to their golden scorpion boy for help. And what Carlo came up with was the original Fiat Abarth 500. He made it look cooler, he made it handle better, he freaking doubled the horsepower to 26. Double the power means double the speed, double the pleasure, double the fun. An icon was born. The Abarth 500 was a success right out of the gate. It broke six international records in 1960 alone. By 1965, this hot little potato had nearly 900 race wins to its name. Carlo and his crew turned a flop into a flyer. A bark didn't just save the 500, they made it the pride of Italy. They made it a pop culture icon, and a bark became so well known as a purveyor of things powerful and Italian that they started using the name a bark as a freaking word to describe anything strong. Customers in cafes didn't ask for strong coffee, they asked for a bark coffee. The 1960s were incredible for a Bart and C. They built some of their greatest cars to date and their aftermarket tuning business expanded across the globe. But Carlo was getting old. And in 1971, he sold his dream company to Fiat, trusting them to carry the banner of the Scorpion into the fray of competition in the future. Carlo Bart passed away in 1979. He was 71 years old. He raced a train and he beat it. He bought a bankrupt company he built one of the most successful performance houses in history. He took economy cars and built world record holders, race winners, and rally champions. He is an eternal badass. And to honor the eternal badass, Fiat put all the Abarth and C designers and engineers in charge of the Fiat racing division, like fully in charge. They were given free reign to work on Fiat's racing cars. And at this time, in the 70s, Fiat was focused on rally racing, and they were campaigning a hardtop version of their little roadster, the 124 Spider. Once the Scorpion got hold of that Spider, the rallying world learned to fear bugs big time. The 124 won the European Rally Championship in 1972 and again in 1975. Now that was cool, but Abarth figured that they could do better. The next car is really freaking cool, you guys, but don't take my word for it. Tyler, the creator, owns one, and he's just about one of the coolest people on the planet. Fun fact, I used to write for him, so. I mean, one look at this thing, and you'll see why he reps the Scorpion. Boom, box flares, baby. The stock Fiat 131 is pretty uninspiring. Clean, very generic, and its performance was as boring as its looks. But in the hands of a Bart, the little rear wheel drive 131 became a rally legend. They gave it a sick, flared out, lightweight fiberglass body and a ripping two liter, 245 horsepower engine. And it won the World Rally Championship in 1977, 1978, and 1980. A three peak. They just weren't feeling it in 79. They had an off year. Now naturally, race fans wanted their own version of this hot little scorpion for the street. And they were like, okay, because Fiat had to build some road cars to satisfy competition rules. So 400, 131 rallies hit European dealerships in 1974. Now, after all that success, weirdly, a BART just sort of ceased to be. Fiat was a huge company, and in the 70s, they were getting even bigger, swallowing up brands left and right, like Nolan at a banana farm. One of those bananas that they swallowed up was Lancia another Italian car company with iconic racing heritage. And for some reason, Fiat put all their racing energy towards Lancia. Now, I can't really complain about that because Lancia in the 80s made some of the most incredible rally cars of all time. The Delta Integrale is probably my favorite car. Tyler Credo owns one of them too. But Fiat's decision to focus on Lancia basically shut the door on a Bart. And in 1981, a Bart and C was no more. Fiat continued to use the name to market slightly hot rotted versions of their cars, but this badge engineering fell flat to true a Bart fans. The banner of the Scorpion, for the most part, remained folded up in a closet. That's where Scorpions live. Until the newly merged Fiat Chrysler Group decided to reintroduce Fiat to America after a two-decade hiatus. Now, these guys, they're not dumb. 
They knew getting Americans to buy small European hatchbacks was tough. And they knew selling the retro Fiat 500 hatchback in America would be an uphill battle despite all the attention its design was getting. Now, it didn't take much of a marketing study to see that Americans loved Volkswagen's GTI. Fiat Chrysler quickly realized that they needed a GTI version of the new 500. Hey, what's up? Uh, guys, just looking in the closet, I found this like really sick Scorpion banner. 2007 Fiat Chrysler Group relaunched a BART as the performance arm of Fiat, just like in the good old days. And with it came a new high performance Fiat 500 Abarth and a new Fiat 124 Spider Abarth. These cars are almost universally considered fun as heck. They have a big, dedicated fan base, and anyone who spends any time behind the wheel of an Abarth knows why. They look very silly to me but they sound good. With the Abarth 595, 695, and even the Abarth 124 One Make European Rally Championship Series, Fiat are honoring Carlo and the Abarth brand exactly how they should, by making cars faster, louder, and more fun. Uh, looks pretty good. Donut has posters? Yeah, Donut has posters. Donut has posters? <laughs> yeah, Donut has posters. Donut has posters? Yep, Donut has posters. Wow! 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 wow. <laughs> posters! Hang them in your bedroom, your office, or have them professionally framed for your garage. Get your Donut posters today at DonutMedia.com. Wow! 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 <laughs> posters! Thank you guys so much for watching this video and everything else on Donut Media. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button uh, so you don't miss anything and hit the like button because it really helps us in the algorithm. The algorithm is the only God that I know. We have a ton of merch uh, that I'm really excited about. Go to DonutMedia.com, uh, check that stuff out. Follow me on Instagram at James Humphrey. I love you.